pill, a syringe, a problem. We laid her here, she flatlined. These are the faces of the opioid epidemic. A mom witnessing her daughter overdose. It was scary. A son focused on getting his next high. It was just my life. I had no control over it. Children born addicted or left parentless. I was putting my own baby in danger and I couldn't stop. And a dealer desperate for a dollar. We don't intentionally try to kill them. We don't care if they die though. It's a crisis impacting first responders. It's dangerous for everybody involved. And innocent bystanders. <laughs> And it has Washington leaders, doctors, and seemingly quiet communities searching for a solution to the crisis killing people across the country. When you see the potency of some of these drugs, it scares everybody. Tonight, KPRC Channel 2 brings you this special presentation, Opioid Nation, an American epidemic. The numbers are staggering. Business leaders, moms, teens, athletes and celebrities addicted and dying. This is an important hour for parents and anybody with a loved one who could be at risk. We're going to break down the problem, the warning signs, what you can do to save yourself or someone you love, and explain why hope of getting control of this nationwide crisis may very well get a boost from what's being done in Houston right now. We begin tonight with one local family story, one story that is being played out in homes in cities, suburbs and rural communities. While Americans represent just 5% of the world's population, the U.S. is said to consume 80% of the world's opioids. And as Owen Conflenti shows us, for a young man named Josh, that drug use came close to killing him. It's ruthless. It takes you, it doesn't care. It'll, it'll put you right in your grave. <laughs> You know, if you let it. On a quiet street in the Houston suburbs, a boy from Canada with big dreams would find himself on a path that nearly led him to his grave. Joshua Steenberg was in second grade when his family moved to Texas. Being Canadian, you know, I always had that dream to go play professional hockey, and that's really what I wanted to do in my life. He played, his dad coached. He seemed to be skating right through school, making friends, adapting to his new home. But in high school, things changed. I began smoking marijuana, hanging out with, you know, the wrong crowd of people. Josh lost sight of his goals, and his parents noticed. I noticed um, he'd sleep a lot, or he'd be in his room a lot. He pulled more away from his brothers. It was like we kind of lost our son. This wasn't part of the family anymore. Josh only wanted to be with his friends, friends that after high school introduced him to a new high. Ecstasy and mushrooms, that lasted a little bit. It wasn't really my thing. Like, I love doing it, but it just, it didn't feel right. He went back to weed, drinking, and then got a job working on oil rigs, making good money. I'd have thousands of dollars, and, you know, I, I'm 19, 20 years old. Like, like, what, what, what could I possibly buy? You know, let's have fun. You know, my friends and everything, they were talking about these cocktails. It was these, these mixture of pills. I remember the first one, it was that warm feeling. You know, it just felt right. It didn't take long before Josh's tolerance built up and he needed more to get the same feeling. We were taking maybe about 50, 60 pills, you know, a day. He then turned to Oxycontin to help him get through each day. It's more money, but it's more bang for your buck. Josh and his friend found themselves stealing from the people closest to them to fund their new love. Josh says some minor legal trouble led to his first stint in rehab and his first admission to his mom that he had a problem. It was a very emotional moment for her because she just found out that I was taking painkillers and, you know, that I'm depressed because I'm not playing hockey anymore and, you know, I hate my life because I feel like the biggest failure. Josh would fail at rehab on his first go-round. Actually relapsed in the rehab. Like, uh, somebody brought something in and handed it to me and I was like, oh yeah, I'll take that. While not sober, Josh scaled back. He worked. He renewed some healthier friendships. There was one guy who was like right there with me every day. Like he, he wanted to help me, you know, just like he was just a good guy. And, you know, we knew each other from high school. And, um, so he, he was kind of like, you know, my, my wingman, my rock. Unfortunately, Josh's rock and his world would crumble on one fateful night. And then on, <laughs> um, Okay, this is where it gets hard. 
Josh shares his painful story in hopes of helping others. Throughout this hour, you will hear more about that fateful night, his downward spiral, and how this moment captured in a single picture finally got him on the road to recovery. Tonight we're bringing you several people's very real battles with addiction. It's important because 91 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose. For many people, it's too late. But for the two former drug dealers, Andy Sirota is about to introduce you to, they hope coming clean helps save others. When I dealt it, I didn't care about who I was selling it to or what happened to them. I've seen more kids die from this. Robert and Kevin, former drug users and dealers, small time sales led to bigger business for both. Before they knew it, they were in deep. If you've got the best stuff, you're gonna get more clients. You're gonna get the money because they wanna spend the least amount of money for the most amount of high. Kevin started using and then selling drugs after being prescribed a painkiller as a teenager. Robert enjoyed the high and popularity that came with selling pot in high school. It was the power, actually. Popularity? It, yeah, it was the popularity. I was the guy. I had the joints out in the parking lot. After years of dealing harder drugs, these recovering addicts and dealers warned pills are still flowing freely in our communities. They're always the other. This epidemic is proof of that. They believe because it's prescribed, that it's okay. Once hooked on painkillers, these guys say it's easy to convince someone heroin is cheaper and stronger. So why would I spend $30 on a pill when I can spend $30 on heroin and get twice as high? Today, heroin is where the serious drug dealers make their millions, but Robert says it won't last. I don't know anybody that came out of it with everything. I don't know anybody either. You're gonna jails, institutions, and death is what we say, but I don't know any drug dealer that didn't end up doing time that had his money packed away. Sooner or later, the law catches up with everybody. Kevin says he's seen people from all walks of life end up addicted. Anybody that says that they, they, will ne they can never become an addict like that is a fool. It's, it can happen to anybody. After facing addiction, prison, and homelessness himself, Robert's now reduced to tears when talking about meeting parents of drug addicted children. Person, each parent introduced themselves and, uh, you know, how they had lost their kids to drugs. And it's the first time I've ever sat in front of parents like that, that, um, just didn't know what to do. Sober five years now, he wants to make up for his mistakes by giving parents information that could save their children's lives. Do they want to hear that I'm sorry because I represent the drug dealer that sold him the drugs at that point? But more than anything, I want to, to them to understand the reality and the truth about addiction, that their kids weren't themselves. Whether it's a teen or senior citizen, there are warning signs of opioid abuse. Things like reduced social interaction, drowsiness, mood swings, constricted pupils, and slowed breathing. For much more on what to look for if you suspect someone you love is addicted to opioids and for resources on getting help, please visit clicktohouston.com slash opioid nation. A local family distraught over losing their son and outraged at the makers of the synthetic opioid that killed him. He said, I think he's dead, he's cold. Even stronger versions are now on the streets of our city. A new seizure raises the opioid crisis in Houston. How these deadly drugs are getting into the country. Fentanyl, uh, about the equivalent of about two, three, four grains of salt could kill you. And what's being done to protect anyone who could be exposed. Next on Opioid Nation, an American epidemic. Good evening, KPRC and our parent company, Graham Media Group, are focusing in on the opioid crisis and we'll be diving deeper into the issues that it causes in the coming weeks and months. We know opioids are vital for so many people who suffer with chronic pain, and we'll be talking about how the crisis is also hurting them too. Tonight, we hope those of you who suspect someone you know is in trouble with opioids will seek help before it's too late. Menninger Clinic, Council on Recovery Houston, and Baylor College of Medicine have some addiction experts here in our studio now to answer questions. Everything from warning signs to options for helping people stop abuse in someone you know or love. The number is 713-778-8920. Shelly Simpson from the Menninger Clinic is here. So, Shelly, really, if you know someone who, who needs help, now's the time. Yes, now is the time. 
If you are uncertain, call. If you are certain, call. If you fall anywhere in between, give us a call. We're here to help, and it just might save a life. That's so true. We appreciate it. Thank you. Additional resources and numbers to 24-hour hotlines are available anytime you need them and can be found at click2houston.com slash opioid nation. 10-year-old Alton Banks spent a fun June day at his neighborhood pool. The fifth grader in Florida began vomiting once he got home and not long after was dead. A sudden tragedy tied to the opioid crisis. Banks somehow, at some point, came in contact with the painkiller fentanyl, a synthetic opioid so powerful that police departments have warned officers about even touching the drug. Fentanyl is 50 times more potent than heroin and two milligrams is all it takes to overdose. That amount is smaller than a penny. Channel 2 investigator Joel Eisenbaum looks at how fentanyl and even stronger synthetic opioids are making this crisis even more deadly. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. Prescribed by doctors, it's used to treat chronic pain for cancer patients. But used illegally, it presents a danger, not only to addicts, but all of us. A sheriff's deputy and two EMTs exposed in Maryland. A police officer in Ohio nearly died after responding to a drug-related call. Eleven SWAT officers sickened last fall in Connecticut. Even a canine officer in Florida became ill after inhaling fentanyl during a drug raid. It was so quick and such a small amount. That's all it takes to take down two grown men, a mere sprinkle of fentanyl. It's not just drug abusers who overdose. Increasingly, it's firefighters, EMTs, and police officers like these men who accidentally breathed in fentanyl just by collecting crime scene evidence. A bunch of it poofed up into the air right in our face, and we ended up inhaling it. The Drug Enforcement Administration has released a video warning for first responders about the potential for danger. Please don't field test in your car or on the street. Harris County Sheriff's deputies have stopped field tests, and they've received training on how to handle scenes where there may be drugs. And now that diligence is even more critical, because what's been dubbed as America's deadliest drug has now also been found on the streets of Houston. The Houston Forensic Science Center has confirmed a seizure of carfentanil. Uh, this drug has been under the radar, but the new seizure raises the opioid crisis in Houston to a new level not yet encountered in, in our city. Car fentanyl, an elephant tranquilizer, 100 times more potent than fentanyl, 10,000 times more powerful than morphine. This is sugar, so what we received was 80 milligrams of car fentanyl. It's just this much. That much right there is enough for 4,000 le lethal doses. The head of the Houston Forensic Science Center says these drugs are so potent, you may not even be able to see a lethal dose. You could get a lethal dose and not even realize that you come into contact with it. Authorities say drug dealers are using car fentanyl and fentanyl to cut their supply of opioids, like heroin, because it's cheaper. That means drug users may not even fully know what they're taking. You know, the last text I got from him the night before he died was, Mom, I need $40 for food. Apparently it wasn't for food. So that's how it all ended. Vicki King's son overdosed on heroin laced with fentanyl. He was just 20 years old, a good kid, talented photographer, someone she never thought would become addicted to opioids. Had an eye for the camera. And I don't think he realized how good he was and he loved it, but then when things started getting bad, that passion started to fizzle away. Two years after his death, she still wonders how he started down that path. He had a snowboard injury. We had some major surgery done and he was probably about 15 or 16 at that time. But I don't know if that's what triggered it. When he went to college, Vicki got her first major wake up call that her son had a drug problem when he landed in an emergency room. And he was there for an overdose. Vicki and her family got her son into recovery that time, but it was short lived and did not save her son from fentanyl. I don't know if I've ever seen anything in my career that's more significant than the fentanyl. Timothy Planson is on the front lines of the opioid battle for the DEA. It's dangerous for everybody involved. It's not just mixed with heroin anymore. Some people take cocaine laced with fentanyl because they think it's less addictive. It's not. 
Others use fentanyl alone. The chemical stuff, or pure fire as it's called, can be found on the streets as liquids, powders, and pills. It's extremely profitable, uh, far more profitable than, than even heroin. Profitable and potent, a deadly combination. Heroin laced with fentanyl is being smuggled in from Mexico, but fentanyl is also being ordered online and shipped in from China. As Channel 2 investigator Robert Arnold learned, these drugs are being delivered by car, plane, and even boat. Synthetic opioids are being trafficked into the U.S. from Canada in Mexico, some funneled through Texas, others snuck through ports, and even more being sent through the mail. Harris County prosecutors say 21-year-old Caleb Poteet ordered more than 100 grams of fentanyl on an underground website. He then had the drugs shipped from China to a post office in Katy. And as more and more families are learning, drugs trafficked in can be even more deadly because there's no way of knowing exactly what's in those drugs. I will never forget those words. He said, I think he's dead. He's cold. He didn't move and, and, and I couldn't basically revive him. Just shy of his 30th birthday, Andres Dabis was discovered dead on the floor of his apartment. He had overdosed on the synthetic opioid known as pink. It's in the same family as heroin, hydrocodone, which is Norco, uh, morphine. Dr. Teresa Gray is the chief toxicologist at the Harris County Institute of Forensic Sciences. They mix it with things that it shouldn't be mixed with and that's what causes the fatal intoxication. Pink is not some invention cooked up in a bathtub lab. Before it got its street name, Pink went by the more clinical U47700. It was created by a pharmaceutical company nearly 40 years ago, but the potent painkiller was never approved for human use. However, the formula was found online and is now being processed overseas, primarily in China. You guys ready? Yeah. Coming up. Other opioids are brought in across U.S. borders with Mexico and Canada. This is a U.S. Customs and Border Patrol boat patrolling the Detroit River in Michigan. This is the international line, the boundary of the United States and Canada. There are no markers in the river. No checkpoints, no gates, just the open water. And that can make patrolling the border challenging, to say the least. You can blend in with any type of boat. It could be a regular boat transferring people or drugs and it looks exactly like a person driving just recreationally. We're seeing amounts and types and seizures like we haven't before. 600 kilograms of fentanyl seized nationally last year and smugglers hide it everywhere. Hidden compartments in cars, trains, planes, boats, buses. A lot of it comes through the post. A lot of it comes through what they call express consignment. Uh, people order off the internet and it shows up at their front door. In a recent find, 2.5 pounds of heroin hidden in this tub of chocolate icing. Another recent seizure, heroin found in prayer items like candles. The drugs themselves are also being disguised. They're developing these pills to look a little more like candy. These drugs were intercepted by deputies from a single cruise docking at Port Canaveral, Florida, and passengers were arrested for packing illegal narcotics. Come on, buddy. Specially trained drug dogs are sniffing out cargo and luggage coming into ports. In this demonstration, you can see how this dog is trained to pick up the scent of drugs. Black tar heroin has been planted in one of the bags for this test. Watch. In less than 20 seconds, the canine named Jake finds the drugs. And you saw how fast the dog was able to find this. And then on top of that, you know, it's well hidden. It's fine that canines are helping to find drugs that may otherwise have slipped through amid the tens of thousands of bags that move through U.S. ports daily. Finding the drugs and identifying the smugglers, a challenging task. I've arrested elderly to teenage kids. Patrols are increasing. They say there isn't a choice. Uh, unfortunately, with the opioids right now, um, if we lose, people die. Death and danger for adults and children. She just started getting fever. She was crying. Ahead, the youngest victims of the opioid crisis. Then later, the opioid crisis is hitting every family of every color, of every socioeconomic status. And I think that's why people are so afraid. How Houston is stepping up to ease fear and find solutions to this American epidemic. Next. Listen, I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you judge me for having a problem. No one is going to know. 
that I need help. I need help. I know that no one is going to judge me for having a problem. I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you listen. Help fight America's prescription drug epidemic. Saturday, October 28th, support the National Prescription Drug Take Back Initiative by turning in your unused or expired medications for safe disposal. Log on to clicktohouston.com for a list of local collection sites. My son was prescribed pain opiates. No one ever told us how highly addictive these drugs were. There's a lot of families that are torn apart, but families can heal. Young people can get better. There's hope and help at drugfree.org. A family's car seen on this police dash cam. Inside the car, three crying children, ages five, two, and one. What's not visible from the camera, their parents lying dead just outside the car. Autopsies would reveal that the couple overdosed on fentanyl. 32-year-old Daniel Kelsey, his 30-year-old wife, Heather, reportedly took the drug before getting in the car with their children and driving down a Florida interstate. The couple's three children now live with their grandparents, fortunately not physically hurt the night their parents made a deadly decision. I want the people that are doing heroin, fentanyl, crack cocaine, even alcohol, all the stuff they're doing. I want them to see exactly what they're doing to their family. And, and people need to quit being nice about it and they need to start saying, you're a drug addict, you need to get some help. The opioid epidemic spares no one. You may have seen a few of the pictures and videos that have gone viral of parents passed out right in front of their children. But for every image that spread on social media, there are a lot more cases you'll never know about. As Rachel McNeil shares, children are being left parentless, many put in harm's way, and some even being born addicted to the drugs themselves. I used uh, crack cocaine and heroin. Crystal Gutierrez was a young girl when she first faced abuse. At nine years old, I was, I was molested by my stepdad. As the years passed, it only became harder for Gutierrez. Growing up fast, you know, um, in and out of the streets and disrespecting, you know, my family. At 16, I got shot and um, I lost my best friend. Gutierrez here is 34 weeks pregnant. The 26-year-old sits in a hospital, dehydrated, tired, and sleepy. Doctors say she just used heroin. Our primary concern is to find out if she is stable and at the same time keeping a very close eye on the baby. Gutierrez is one of many Texas moms getting help with addiction in order to give her baby a shot at a healthier life. The concern? Drugs absorbed in the womb can cause the baby to experience withdrawal symptoms after birth. It's a condition called neonatal abstinence syndrome, or NAS. I was putting my own baby in danger and I couldn't stop. And that's when I found out about heroin. Victoria Ortiz witnessed the impact of addiction on her baby girl, Gracie. She just started getting fever. She was crying. She had to run. Now eight months old, the start of Gracie's life was not an easy one. That she did nothing to do, you know, to deserve it. Neonatologist Dr. Charles Hankins from Texas Children's Hospital in the Woodlands says the opioid crisis is putting a growing number of newborns in danger. And then that baby will often start to withdraw at some point. It may be hours, it may be a day or more after birth before you start seeing symptoms in the baby. Symptoms like irritability and an inability to feed. CPS got involved, you know, when she was born. Uh, they were wanting to, you know, take her away. Child Protective Services, Texas, has to get involved in many of these cases. And so many of these cases end up going into the Texas foster system. That's why hospitals are working to keep mom and baby together after the child is born. We put baby skin to skin with mom and keep them there as long as possible. That close contact, along with additional treatment, has proven to be effective in breaking addiction for mom and baby. We see an earlier discharge with less need for medications for those moms who are engaged, who are always visiting the baby. Just a few months from celebrating both Gracie's first birthday and Ortiz's one-year anniversary of sobriety, they're both proof the NAS program works. 
These babies can go and live normal lives, and, and, and that is the hope and, and the expectation. That is Gutierrez's hope, too, after taking the medication methadone to reduce withdrawal symptoms. She's just so adorable. Gutierrez had her baby just a few weeks ago. I look at her and I and I thank God that that she saved me cuz I I was going down the wrong path. Dr. Hankins from Texas Children's Hospital in the Woodlands says three quarters of babies born with NAS in Texas are on Medicaid and the care they need is very expensive. But stopping the cycle of addiction early could also be crucial to controlling the opioid epidemic. Caseworkers say children of addicts too often grow up to be addicts themselves, a vicious cycle that with the right care could now be broken before birth. It's very easy for ordinary people to get hooked on these drugs. Ahead, controlling pain without creating addicts. Doctors talk about their industry's role in the opioid epidemic. Plus, the controversy over an elixir that can bring a person who has overdosed back to life. Knew I had the tools to help this person. And from addiction. I lost it that night. To relapse. I didn't really care what happened to me anymore. To recovery, more of one local man's very personal drug crisis when we return. Addiction can hold a firm grip if you don't know where to find help. That's why addiction specialists are in our studios right now to take your calls. The number is 713-778-8920. President Trump in August declared the opioid crisis an active national emergency. And heroin in recent years has become the number one overdose killer. So there's no time to wait. Please call if you or if someone you know may be hooked on pain pills or heroin. We have much more information on the opioid crisis, including an interactive look at how the drugs impact the body at click2houston.com. There you'll also find additional phone numbers to access 24 hours a day so that you can find help and recovery whenever you need it. You're looking at a woman lying on a stretcher, lifeless after an opioid overdose. Seemingly dead, she suddenly sits up revived by a drug called naloxone. That controversial antidote, also known as Narcan, is being used to save first responders and innocent bystanders. But as Channel 2 investigator Bill Spencer tells us, some worry it's also giving addicts a feeling of invincibility. I just ripped her out. We laid her here, she flatlined. Her breath, silent, and her pulse, gone. A 23-year-old woman we're calling Susie was dead until a deputy brought her back to life in a movie-like moment. Well, I don't know if anybody's seen the movie Pulp Fiction, but it was pretty much like that. Showing the life-saving efforts of overdose reversal drug naloxone, also known as Narcan. I knew I had the tools to help this person, and I didn't have to watch someone perish. It was a moment Susie's mom is thankful for today. Narcan saved her life. Knowing that her daughter had overdosed before, but never seeing it for herself. It was startling, and it was numbing, and it was scary, especially when she sat right up. But it wasn't the first time, and it wouldn't be the last. Will you accept treatment? Yes. In 2012, she went on Anderson Cooper's talk show with Susie and her sister trying, even then, to break their addiction. What's it like for you to hear that? I'm elated, and I really hope that they grab hold. But Susie never followed through with rehab and is still addicted to heroin today. Eight days after this overdose, she OD'd again. And once again, Narcan saved her life. She wants to do good and she wants to be an active member of society. She just wants to be normal. And there's always this monkey on her back. And both times Susie was saved, the Narcan was thanks to government resources. According to the CDC, government agencies have been stocking up on Narcan for the last two decades, but didn't really need it until recent years. The latest study from 2015 shows the number of organizations providing Narcan increased 183%, saving more than 26,000 lives. In an effort to protect law enforcement, officials, and our community, Harris County has purchased more than 260 nasal spray doses of Narcan. But the CDC wants more users and their loved ones to have access to. 
What you might not even know is that in 41 states right now, including Texas, you can actually walk up to a pharmacist and get Narcan yourself without a prescription. The intramuscular injection is about $45. The nasal spray is about $110. Sweetness Health wanted to provide naloxone to more patients, be able to save lives. We want to give those patients a second chance at getting the recovery they need. But there are critics out there who say that Narcan is not a savior. Instead, it's an enabler. These were just some of the comments posted on social media after Susie's overdose. Letter overdose. Should not be spending taxpayer money and resources reviving these people. Only problem is, she'll do it again tomorrow. Still, addiction experts say drug users shouldn't be written off. When you're waking up every day and you need something to function, that's an addiction and it's a disease. A disease that requires big help to overcome. So no matter if there's um, Narcan available or not, they're going to push the limits of it because that's what their disease tells them that they need to do. If your son or daughter overdosed, would you want them to have something easily accessible to bring them back to life or would you just want them to die? Distribution of Narcan, now such an important part of battling the opioid epidemic that one pharmaceutical company actually donated thousands of doses right after Hurricane Harvey to organizations that care for people who could be at risk of opioid overdoses. The goal, to make sure that flood victims who may have had to flee their homes still have access to this life-saving medication. Federal statistics show that most drug overdose deaths, at least six out of 10, involve an opioid. For the young man we introduced you to earlier in this program, an accident, one tragic night, put him back on the path to becoming a statistic. Fortunately, that changed the day his mom found him passed out on her porch. Owen Conflenti has more of Josh's story. Josh seemingly was moving beyond the chapter of his life that centered around drugs, thanks in part to the support of a good friend, someone he called his rock. Things were going well. There was one night, he hopped on his motorcycle, uh, no helmet, and he uh, pulled out of the neighborhood, zoomed out, zoomed in, hit the curb, flew headfirst, doing about 60 miles an hour into a stop sign. I remember like holding his head while we were trying to give him CPR, and everybody else in the background just screaming and crying. And um, EMS gets there and they say, uh, they put the defibrillator on and they say, you can let go of his neck, he's dead. <laughs> I, I lost it that night. And uh, I didn't really care what happened to me anymore. <laughs> I felt like I died that night too. After a period of sobriety that night, Josh says he began to down pills again, then eventually turned to heroin. Only certain people knew about my usage at that point. My parents weren't one of them. Josh held down a retail job primarily to pay for his addiction. It's like you work to get high, to get high to work. Every single dollar that I got went to heroin. Like I would go to the gas station and I would steal Rice Krispie treats because I didn't want to buy food because, you know, that's $5 I that could have went to heroin. It was just my life. It revolved around it. I had no control over it. Dug a little bit deeper and dug a little bit deeper and, you know, it just didn't really seem like I was gonna put the shovel down anytime soon. The hole Josh was digging finally hit rock bottom three years ago. His mom found him passed out on her front porch after taking a shot of heroin. I came home and he was passed out in the porch in the middle of the summer and so I sent him to bed and that's when we decided to have our intervention. My mom says, we want to know everything, said, I'm a heroin addict, I can't stop, it's too powerful, um, like it just has this grip on me and I, like, I can't repeat it. I looked at her, she started crying and you know, I told her, I was like, why do you think I wear long sleeve shirts in the middle of summer in Texas? His arms were all marked up. I'm a nurse for 20 years and I didn't see any signs. I didn't see any of it and um, I felt like it was my fault. Josh's story continues later in this program, but now we turn our attention to the word you just heard his mom use, fault. It's a common word in the drug crisis. Who's at fault? The user? the dealer, or the pharmaceutical companies and doctors who for years said opioids were the answers to a patient's pain. Channel 2 consumer expert Amy Davis says now we know that first prescription can be all it takes to turn everyday people into addicts. 
In June, Texas and 40 other states launched a coalition to determine if drug makers and distributors broke any laws amid the opioid epidemic. Just last month, the Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton announced that several subpoenas and additional requests had been served to eight different companies. An investigation is underway, and it's one that's been decades in the making. There's no question that our best, strongest pain medicines are the opioids. Back in the 90s, this video came out titled, I Got My Life Back. They don't wear out, they go on working, they do not have serious medical side effects. A doctor enthusiastically endorsed OxyContin. Fellow physicians got on board and patients looking for relief from pain began asking for that opioid by name. Taking you back to the 80s and 90s, okay, uh, it was a perfect storm. Doctors wanted to help. Drug companies wanted to sell product. Even federal agencies were on board. The government got involved and said, doctors, you have to treat pain more aggressively. Opioids work by turning off pain receptors in the brain. There was some very early research suggesting addiction shouldn't be a concern, but boy, was that wrong. What we've done, literally, is, is done the largest experiment in human history on 300 million people. And we've been doing it for 30 years, and now we have data. And the data is not very pretty. It's not just the doctors who have to be careful. The patients have to be careful, too. While they may not become addicted to the medications, leaving them stored unused in the home or giving them to a loved one thinking it's going to help them could ultimately harm them. In spite of the risk, opioids are still the best option for some patients in pain and those with lifetime or terminal illnesses. As physicians, if we do decide to initiate opioids, we have to do our due diligence to protect society patients. Doctors are now advised to dispense fewer pills, choose the least potent or addictive medication to manage the pain, and even play detective to determine if a patient is abusing their prescriptions. There's a small minority of patients who are drug seeking that will come to any doctor's office. In some places, that means doctors run a patient's name through a database before prescribing narcotics. Since the launch of the multi-state investigation into pharmaceutical companies, many of those companies have turned down requests for on-camera interviews. In written statements related to the opioid crisis, Purdue Pharma, which previously paid more than $600 million in a lawsuit about OxyContin, says, we share public officials' concerns about the opioid crisis, and we are committed to working collaboratively to find solutions. And Teva states it is committed to the appropriate promotion and use of opioids. You can read the company's full statements and learn more about what pharmaceutical companies are doing now to warn the public about the risks of opioids on the Opioid Nation section of click2houston.com. Controlling opioid use is such a focus of this crisis, you may be surprised by what at least one Houston expert suggests might be the answer. You've heard of medical marijuana. Well, this research suggests that we need to start talking about pharmaceutical-grade heroin as the key to cutting down on opioid deaths. Channel 2 investigator Mario Diaz explains. A researcher with Rice University's Baker Institute recently published this blog, and it reads, Want fewer people to die from an opioid overdose? Give them heroin. Heroin-assisted treatment uh, is a form of treatment where you provide heroin users with pharmaceutical grade heroin in a clinical setting. Catherine Neal Harris says heroin assisted treatment was available in the United States until the early 1920s and it is still available in other countries. It is controversial in this country for sure. Controversial, but she says it has been proven to decrease the demand for illicit heroin, reduce criminal activity associated with obtaining heroin, and most importantly, reduce overdose deaths. There are other treatments like replacement drugs which can curb cravings and manage withdrawal symptoms, but they are not always effective. The idea of providing people with a replacement drug, I think, is uh, you know more palatable um, for a lot of people. I think the idea of actually giving people heroin uh, just turns a lot of, of folks off. Supporters say permission needs to be granted by the federal government for states and localities to test heroin-assisted therapy on a small scale. That there is an opportunity to allow localities to experiment with these kinds of programs on a pilot basis. If this can stop people from dying, then we should try it. Trying to fight the opioid epidemic begins with tackling the topic with those most at risk. And I found that certain sports, more likely high contact sports, those athletes were more likely to misuse opioids. 
Ahead, the effort to spread awareness to athletes. Plus, the Houston high schools designed to help addicted teens get their lives back on track. We were created by a group of parents who had lost their children to addiction. Opioid Nation, an American epidemic, will be right back. Everything all right? Actually, you know how Tom had knee surgery? Sure. We found out Brad's been taking his painkillers. It turns out he's been doing it for a while. Most people don't know what to say about drugs, but we do. Visit us at drugfree.org. Help fight America's prescription drug epidemic. Saturday, October 28th, support the National Prescription Drug Take Back Initiative by turning in your unused or expired medications for safe disposal. Log on to click2houston.com for a list of local collection sites. Prince, dead at 57 after accidentally overdosing on fentanyl. Philip Seymour Hoffman, gone at 46. His apartment filled with evidence of heroin abuse. And Corey Monteith of Glee fame, overdosed after mixing heroin and alcohol. He was just 31 years old. Celebrities to everyday citizens, the opioid crisis is hitting people from Hollywood to small towns across America. And a growing number of those addicts are young athletes who first take painkillers after being injured playing, but may keep relying on the drugs long after they've been prescribed. As Keith Garvin explains, that's why one of football's biggest role models is doing something to save young players. When Jerome Bettis comes to town, crowds gather. The bus may be on a football field surrounded by teen players, but the discussion today is not about X's and O's. Instead, it's about drug abuse, specifically opioid addiction. It's in all of our communities, and if we don't deal with that issue, it's going to affect more and more of our children. According to the CDC, opioids were involved in more than 33,000 deaths in 2015, and opioid overdoses have quadrupled since 1999. With sports come injuries, and athletes have the added pressure of doing what it takes to return to the field. To just throw out narcotics and opiates just so you can play a game, I think is inappropriate. Dr. Anthony Colucci is the medical director at Henry Ford Macomb and is also the team doctor for the Detroit Red Wings. He says the use of opioids should only be prescribed for 48 hours post-surgery. The doctors started this whole problem as they were given 60 tablets, a week's worth, two weeks worth, unlimited. Back in 2013, a University of Michigan three-year study of 743 male and 751 female adolescents found male adolescent athletes who participated in competitive sports had two times greater odds of being prescribed painkillers and had four times greater odds of medically misusing painkillers. And I found that certain sports, more likely high contact sports, those athletes were more likely to misuse opioids. And also there's the culture around high contact sports as playing through pain. They might want to mask it with some sort of drug so they can get back on the playing field as soon as possible. By the time high school athletes become seniors, approximately 11% will have used a narcotic pain reliever such as Oxycontin or Vicodin for non-medical purposes. We can't say that simply because they're misusing them, they're gonna be get it, become addicted. Mm -hmm. However, they're increasing the risk. As for Bettis, he says he's never dealt with an addiction to opioids personally. He was lucky to not sustain a serious injury in his football career, but he's seen other NFL players struggle. But there were some horror stories about guys that uh, abused uh, the, the pain medication. It started because of an injury. Eventually, prescriptions expire, but the addiction remains and the jump to heroin is an easy one. What's the answer? Dr. Colucci says education. The biggest thing is we as clinicians have to be responsible with education and the prescribing practices, but also I think it, there's a point where the players have to take a responsibility, the parents have to take a responsibility. Don't just bury your head in the sand. Enter big star athletes like the bus who's driving the message home right to those who look up to him. While there's an effort to keep kids from getting hooked in the first place in Houston, attention is also being placed in the classroom to make sure teens who have already overcome addiction can get the support that they need to finish school and to stay clean. Jacob Rascone has more. 
Every day at Archway is a beautiful mixture of traditional education. The classrooms at Archway Academy look like any other school. The kids are taking math and science and English and history and they're taking the PSAT. But tucked away inside a church, in the shadows of the medical center, this high school is all about addiction recovery. When we started asking kids, where do you have the easiest access to drugs? They would tell a school. Uh, where are most of your dealers? They would tell a school. This is one of Archway's science classrooms. So we decided in 2004 that maybe what Houston needed was a school that was devoted specifically to students with drug and alcohol issues. It's a school for kids who've already been to rehab and need a safe place to learn and heal. We were created by a group of parents who had lost their children to addiction. The Archway Recovery Program used to be one of just a handful nationwide. Now it's a model copied across the country. We have folks from every area of the country that come here and spend time with us to learn what a recovery school is and to take back what they've learned into their community. The day begins with morning check-in. The students open up about anything from a fight with their parents to an urge to use again. And that's where the recovery staff were able to kind of put our finger on the pulse of the community. How's everyone doing? Then the traditional classes get underway. They're sitting in a math class and they start having really high anxiety or they start feeling extremely irritable. They know that their teacher can call down to our support office and we'll have a recovery coach come to them in their class. Part of the magic of Archway Academy is that half of our staff are in personal recovery from substance use disorders, including myself. Archway is one of about 40 private high school recovery programs nationwide. Public programs like that are even more rare. But this year, one of them is opening right here in Harris County. We understand that it's going to be pretty much unprecedented in Harris County and moving in this direction with the current epidemic that's going on right now. The recovery center will be open to any high school student in Harris County free of charge. The school is not a rehabilitation high school. We will have expected our students to go through some formal rehabilitation process. Our goal is not to send them back to the high school for which their addiction could have started, but in other words, they can come to our high school to do the recovery process. The 20,000 square foot facility is being renovated from an old school in the Greenspoint area. We're going to have a quarter million dollar culinary arts facility. Then we're going to have almost a gazebo with an oriental garden in the back, ropes course. But they'll also have a rappel line where students can rappel across the parking lot to here. Uh, this is going to be part of their trust activities that they do, uh, belief systems, but it's also going to integrate into a PE credit too. Students can request to attend the program directly through their ISD. Schools like this rarely have more than 100 students. If necessary, we will build more than one recovery high school down the road. Public and private recovery programs fighting the opioid epidemic, breaking the addiction cycle, one school, one student at a time. Every student knows that from 8 o'clock to 3 o'clock, they have recovery support people here just waiting to give them whatever it is that they need. And we oftentimes look at it and think it's about being weak-willed or something like that. Addiction is a disease, it's not just a condition. A disease that's being battled in Houston in innovative ways. This is very cutting edge. From virtual reality to new products relieving pain after surgery. I didn't actually need any medication. Ahead, how our city is leading the way in saving people from addiction. And the next chapter of Josh's story. You can change your life at any given moment in time, you just need to decide. What it took to finally get Josh to choose life over drugs when opioid nation and American epidemic continues. While the average person thinks about their future in terms of years, it is said that addicts only think about the next nine days. That's why many need help figuring out a path towards a drug-free life. That is why so many will need help, and KPRC has addiction specialists on hand to help you figure out the first steps towards recovery. We have a phone number for you. It's 713-778-8920. These experts here are from the Council on Recovery Houston, the Manager Clinic, and Baylor College of Medicine, and they're going to be here uh, until 8 o'clock, taking your questions. They are also 24-hour uh, hotlines that you can call whenever you need help, and we've posted those numbers and additional information and some more resources at clicktohouston.com slash opioid nation. You know, 
Jail doesn't make somebody sober. It won't make somebody clean. And it certainly won't give them the tools they need to survive. But Star can. You're looking at a video posted on the Star Drug Court webpage. Star, which stands for Success Through Addiction Recovery, has been part of the Harris County District Court system since 2003. Across the country, drug courts aim to give nonviolent drug offenders a chance at rehabilitation, a chance to avoid being locked up. Without that chance, the National Association of Drug Court Professionals says as many as 95% of incarcerated addicts return to drug abuse after they're released. Drug courts are said to not only reduce relapse, but are also believed to be more cost-effective than recurring arrests, trials, and prison time for repeat offenders who didn't get help. Bill, a lot is being done in both the courts and across Houston to combat the opioid crisis. KPRC medical reporter Haley Hernandez shows us the innovative ways Houston researchers and doctors are working to stop addiction. Hey, come on in. I'm Marcia. What's your name? Tucked away in a small room at the University of Houston is a cave. Is that here? Inside this cave, researchers are using virtual reality to help addicts kick their heroin addiction. I believe that it is um, the first in the nation around to be able to investigate the use of this technology around heroin and opiates. Mickey Washburn oversees day-to-day -day operations of the lab. This is very cutting edge. Addicts strap on a virtual reality headset and navigate through a house party scenario. Details like an open pizza box to a spoon and syringe on a table are meant to enhance sensations and trigger a heroin craving. In this controlled environment, we're teaching them coping skills. This virtual reality would not replace traditional therapy. If we can have multiple tools to help people who are trying to combat their addiction, we're giving them a better chance of success. Inside this small hospital just off the Southwest Freeway, more potential breakthroughs. What I've seen so far has been amazing. Dr. Harold Minkowitz is leading a clinical trial. How to prevent people from becoming addicted to opioids in the first place. It's a problem. People are being given these opioids postoperatively, taking them home and becoming uh, chronic users. In fact, opioid addiction can set in in as little as seven days. So Minkowitz is testing out a potential miracle solution in the operating room during extreme surgeries like a tummy tuck. During the surgery, patients are given opioids during the surgery because you're correct, it's a very traumatic and it's a very large operation. But after the surgery ends, this special goo is placed over the wound. The opioid use ends once the patient leaves the operating room. Mary Hernandez had her tummy tuck with the goo in December, right before Christmas. Post-op surgery after that, and when we went home, I didn't actually need any medication. This is a double blind study. There is a placebo group and a control group, but neither the patient nor doctor know which group they're in. They could have all been placebo, but the response was so dramatic that it was pretty amazing. Trials and research can take years to prove effective, so the Houston area is on the forefront of a more immediate remedy. Good morning, class. Dr. Rosalind Morales is training the next generation of nurse practitioners. The philosophy, take care of the patient as a whole. Not only their physical needs, but their their mental, psychological, and spiritual needs. If a patient requires pain management, we want to do something on a short-term basis that has a lower risk of abuse. We refer out for physical therapy, massage, acupuncture, those sorts of things. The pharmacist speaking, how may I help you? The pharmacist also has a crucial role in the opioid epidemic. If there's something fishy about the prescription itself or they just don't feel comfortable with the use or the amount that the prescription is written for, it's up to that pharmacist's clinical judgment to fill it or to not fill it. Stephanie Crowley is training at the University of Houston's Pharmacy College. A big part of her study learning about Texas's new drug monitoring program. Dr. Mark Fleming teaches at U of H and is a big advocate for the program. Pharmacists and physicians alike, they can actually uh, put a patient's information in and access all their controlled substance prescription history. The program launched in Texas in 2012, but recently the state pharmacy board took over the program. Now more pharmacists are using it and starting in September 2018, it will be mandatory. Well, you can see a patient, oh, they've been to eight different doctors. They've been to 20 pharmacies in the past six months. 
From there, pharmacy students are taught they can use that opportunity to intervene with the patient and find out what's really going on. I view it as a, a life-saving tool. We began this program with a young man named Josh who nearly lost everything to opioids. Now we hear what it finally took to change his life story. After his mom found Josh passed out on her porch, the family had an intervention. Josh recalls how upset his mother was and how calm his father was. You know, he said, I, I already have this whole, um, like everything set, you know, will, will you go to rehab and will you get help? <laughs> I, I was crying pretty bad. And um, so I said, yeah, you know what, let's go. Another shot at clean living began that day, not just for Josh, but also for his parents. That was like the first night I wasn't going to get called. He was dead or in jail. Josh was admitted to Memorial Hermann's Prevention and Recovery Center, known as PARC. The, the way the opioids work on the receptors in the brain is such that it creates that, that need. It's almost like food and water and other uh, requirements of living. And it starts to impact family, starts to impact professional and other areas of your life. And so what we're trying to do is help people figure that out and put those things back together. For Josh, putting things back together began with a difficult detoxification period and talking about how he got there. I was ready to leave. I was looking at, I was looking at a fence, just like I should hop it, you know? It's like, I'm just so over this. That's when a woman at the center suggested he pray. I, I don't pray, I'm not religious. But he did it anyway. You know, I put my head down, I closed my eyes. I remember subconsciously just saying like, you know, please just give me a sign. At that point, he was called in for a group session. Seconds later came his sign. This guy comes up and says, you know, my, my name's Bob. I'm Canadian, I love playing hockey, and I loved pills, and I was like, oh. Wait, I'm Canadian, I love playing hockey, and I used to love pills, but now I love heroin. It was the connection Josh needed to realize he could go on living without drugs. Bob became his sponsor, and Josh became a more active participant in his recovery. A lot of what prevents people from dealing with this problem is they don't feel like they can live effectively without it. But here's the reality. Most of the people that are in that stage are not living effectively with it. Through Park, Josh finally felt hope again. He returned to what he truly loved, the ice rink, and teaching kids how to play hockey. He says his employer and the parents of the kids he teaches know what he's overcome. I were hearing the parents talking, and like in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh my God, like I'm a heroin addict, you know? You just told me that your kid told me I'm a role model, like, what? And they're like, we don't see you as that, you know? You're, you're just this amazing guy who our kid loves. You know, I'm grateful to be alive. Um, I'm grateful to have my friends and my family. Family that supports him, even though after three years, they still worry. There's still days that I call him just to do a, hey, you okay? You still good? You still sober? I don't think I'll ever stop looking for the, you know, the warning signs. I don't think it will matter if it's two years or 20 years. Josh's parents warn others not to look the other way if they notice signs of addiction. Watch who your kid is hanging out with, who they're talking to. It's a message echoed by others we've introduced you to over the last hour. Don't be the mom that I was and don't say, oh, my kid would never, ever, ever do that. Always be on the alert, always, always be on the alert. Speak up. We cannot help him anymore, but we hope to even just save one life. And don't give up hope. Josh and his family are grateful his life story continues. He's on the path. I think he's still got a ways to go. Um, but one day at a time. And they now look forward to the future. I have, I have my son back, you know. Josh's family is proof that while the opioid crisis is all around us, we can overcome it. Whether it's you or someone you love, you don't have to battle addiction alone. Get help now. It could be the difference between life and death. Remember, whenever you need it, you can find the latest on this crisis and addiction resources on the Opioid Nation page of click2houston.com. We'll see you back here for Channel 2 News at 10. For now, have a good night.